rain, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem great all the whole day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see, my friend, trust in His promises, to be more open to what it is that 
that we're going to tell them. Because really what we're sharing with them is very, very important, is it not? I mean, it, it is, it's, it's a matter of life and death. Um, especially in light of the fact that it is possible for people to be disciples of Jesus and teach things that are contrary to the will of Jesus. In the book of Mark, chapter 10, there are people that are bringing uh, their kids to Jesus and, and they're, they want him to hold them, to touch them, you know, to, uh, to get that blessing that they seem to think that Jesus will provide that does provide. He was, he's been healing people. You know, maybe some of their kids were unwell. There is not a single parent that I know of that likes to see their child sick. You know, and so it's very, it's, it was very important to these parents. But the disciples of Jesus in this story they're rebuking these parents. No, don't do this. Don't do this. And Scripture says there, Jesus was indignant. That's the word that's used there. He was not at all happy in any shape, form, or fashion with the people that were his disciples. We need to understand that even as disciples of Christ, it's important for us to do right things right. How often is a, is a task put before us and we do the we do the right thing wrong, or we, uh, for instance. Um, we know that we have to, uh, there is, let me use this illustration. Where I work, we have a vehicle for months. I mean, literally for months. It needs, it needs a tune-up. It needs a tune-up. You go out there and you try to start, it just doesn't want to start. Doesn't want to start. Doesn't want to start. And, and, and then every once in a while, it will backfire out the tailpipe. Bang! You know, and it needs a tune-up. And because this has been going on so long, I know that the spark plugs are now fouled, and so that adds to the problem. So, so here's, here's an example of doing the right thing wrong. If you're going to do a tune-up, there are certain steps to follow. So you're going to go do this tune-up, and uh, uh, you know it needs a tune-up, and so you replace two of the spark plugs. Um, you replace the distributor cap, but you don't replace the rotor. You're doing, you know, you're doing what needs to be done. It's right, needs a tune-up, but it's wrong. Okay. Uh, let's say you do the wrong thing right. You know how to do a tune-up. You have your timing gun that you're going to hook up there. So when it's running, you can flash that light and you'll be able to see, you'll be able to adjust the, uh, the distributor to make sure that the timing is where, because, you know, as those pistons come up and down, they have to fire at the right time. You know, and so you, you, you're going to replace the all four, it's a four cylinder. You're going to replace all four plugs. You're going to replace the wires. You're going to replace the distributor, the rotor. Uh, you're going to set the timing, you know, and, and if there happens to be a need for a carburation adjustment, you'll be able to do that as well. Make sure you have the fuel and air mix. So you're going to do all of this. You go out there, you pop the hood, you do all of this and come to find out it's not the right vehicle. You did this to a car that's already running well. You did the right thing wrong. <laughs> still backfiring, still doing something that it ain't supposed to do. The only way that we're going to be able to do the right thing right is if we follow 
He who shows us how to do that. If we're going to be disciples of Christ, discipling others, it's important that we follow Christ. We need to follow Christ so closely in this. It's, it's, it's like this. We got the sun coming out. We've had some rain, some cloudy days, you know, and, and we're just excited to be able to see shadows. So when you go outside and you're, you're walking into the sunlight and you turn behind you, what's the first, one of the first things that you should see there is your own shadow. How closely you ever try, go out there and do the Peter Pan thing. Skip to the side real fast. See if your shadow doesn't catch up, you know. It, 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 it catches with you like two or three seconds. It ain't happening. You skip to the side. You run away. Your shadow is right on you. Right? That's, that's actually turned in, in, in Matthew chapter 4. Look at verse 19. He says, follow me. This word, this phrase, follow me, it comes from two, two Greek words. Uh, one, it means to, uh, to do that, you know, to, to stay, stay close, you know, to stay close. The other idea is to stay behind. So it's the word, the, the phrase here could actually be follow right behind. That's the idea here. If we're going to be disciples of Christ, discipling others for Christ, we need to make sure that we follow right behind the leadership, the servantship of Jesus. And I say servant because you can't be a good leader unless you are first a good follower. That's a fact. That's a fact. Yeah. I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. Because we have to first look at verse 18. What's going on in verse 18? Walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. If you've ever fished with a net, there's a couple of different ways to do this. You know, you can do a drop, uh, a, a drop, uh, net where, where the top of the net is held there with buoys, with floats, you know, and then it just hangs like a curtain. And so you'll have two boats. You'll have one that stays in position and the other one will take it out and then come around to the other boat. And it encircles the fish inside that net. Uh, these guys were using a circular net and they were, they would cast it. The outer ring of the net has a rope in it. And, and the, and the edges are weighted a little bit. They're actually weighted a little bit with that rope because the rope is heavier than the rest of the material. So when, so when they grab this and they throw it out there, it goes in a circle and then it drops and then they pull. And as it pulls, it closes, you know, picture, picture a balloon, you know, uh, it, it closes and then inside the upper portion, you have the fish trapped in there and then they, Pull them into the boat. <clears throat> so they're, they're doing that. This, this was their job. Now we have to keep in mind that according to John chapter one, by this time, in, in we have Matthew 4, 18, these guys are already disciples of Jesus. They're all, they've all, they're already, you know, looking to him as their spiritual teacher, you know, however you want to describe that. Uh, but what Jesus says is, follow me. And so this is a point that they have reached in their life where they are leaving their nets behind. Now, not, I, I know that's not going to be easy for any of us. In fact, it's, it's probably going to be impossible because we have, we have, uh, obligations that our current careers help us to fulfill. Does that mean that we still can't follow Jesus? We can, we can still follow him. 
you know. So we follow him where we are, the best way that we can. They were fishermen. This was their job, you know, however, however many hours in the day they would fish. And I know, I know that when it comes to fishing, we, we, uh, you, in the state, you know, you're required to get a fishing license and you're, you, you have a limit, you know. How long does it take you to get that limit? I have been on, I have been on a ship where people were catching fish so fast and using zero bait. They would take their poles, they would throw them out there. As soon as that hook hit the water, bam, they're yanking mackerel out of the ocean. You know, they go like this, throw it up there, just hit the deck, you know, they pull the hook off, throw it back out. Uh, it was, it was an, um, I will never forget, uh, that day, you know, uh, being out there in the middle of the ocean and watching these sailors just catch fish after fish after fish. It was pretty awesome. So they got their limit fast. What if you don't? You throw that net out there like, these guys would do from time to time. Remember, they told Jesus at one time, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus said, cast your net. You know, they said, you know, we've been out here all day and have caught nothing. Remember that? All day. It's going to be like that for us. We follow Jesus best we can. Uh, Looking for that limit. We get it like this? Amen. We don't? Does that mean that we quit throwing our hook in the water? No. No, that's right. That's right. We, we just keep, we keep trying. Um, follow me. So when Jesus says, follow me, we have to understand that when he says this, it implies that he has the answers for how it is that we are to follow. Again, this is talking about doing the right things right. And that's the only way it's going to happen. So we've got to be able to follow Jesus. How did Jesus do these things? What were the, what were the questions that we were, that were to ask people? Those three questions, remember? Do you read your Bible? Do you read it every day? Do you study it? Right? Those are the questions. We, okay, I'm going to toss out a, a, a huge assumption here. We, as members of a church which understands John seventeen three. Uh, let's look at that just real fast. John seventeen three. This is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. We cannot know Him unless we are spending time studying the only revealing source of who he is. Okay, so the huge assumption is, I, I'm, I'm talking to y'all who study your Bible, right? We are studying to show ourselves approved and unto God. Workmen who need not to be ashamed. Handling rightly, handling, handling accurately the word of truth. So if we are, <clears throat> if we are studying then we will be able to know just exactly how it is that Jesus acts in certain situations. How does he work in this situation? How does he work in this situation? How does he work in this situation? And so when I find myself in, in situation A, B, or C, I will have a better chance of helping someone to follow Jesus if I myself am behaving in the same way that Jesus would were he in that situation, right? He's the leader. 
when he says, follow me, he's not doing that for no reason. It also implies we don't have the answers. Right? We, this is where humility comes in there. Okay, Jesus, I have some ideas. You know, I, I think you know, it'll work this way. I think it'll work that way. But, but you said to cast my net on this side of the boat, not this side of the boat. Because this side of the boat is where the hundred plus fish were. I, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was 175 fish they caught, right? I think that's what it was. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if those watching this, uh, through YouTube or Facebook, they find that passage. If I'm wrong, put a comment in there. I will thank you very much. Um, follow me. And he says, I'll make you fishers of men. When he says this, he is telling us that there is a specific target and a specific practice by how that's done. Again, you know, it's fishing takes patience. Uh, it takes time. Um, it, it also means that if I'm throwing my hook into this water time and time, Time and time and time again, and I'm not catching anything. Do I go back out tomorrow and throw my hook into that pond again? Might be better to find some different waters to fish, at least until that pond is restocked, right? You know, so... Uh, We'll talk more about this when we get to this other point, but, but anyway, yeah, it, it might be a good idea to go somewhere, uh, different, do some fishing, but, but in any case, those, those things are, uh, talked about there. And, and, and again, it says immediately they left the nets and followed him in verse 20. Um, Follow me. We have to follow Jesus. All right, let's go into the find part. Let's skip down in Matthew chapter 4, and, and let's look at verses 23 and following, okay? Uh, because we have, we have some concepts that are referred to here that I think are very important for us uh, to discuss. It says, Jesus was going about in all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. And the news about him went out into all Syria and they brought to him all who were ill, taken with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. And great multitudes followed him from Galilee and Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. You get the idea that what he's doing is drawing a crowd, right? Uh, I, I guess I want to use the word marketing here. Um, he's, he's basically, how is he advertising? When you look at this passage, what's he doing? Have, have you all, I've talked about this new... Internet store. I don't. I don't want to put the name up here, but you've probably seen their ads. Uh, you may have even bought something. They they come in orange bags. A lot of it does. Um, I told you about that flashlight. I've seen two different ads. One was eighty seven cents or something like that. The other one was a dollar forty nine. And this flashlight, it's a beamer. I am telling you what. It throws off some light. Uh, I mean, if the advertisement was a was was an unretouched video of what he did, you know, but he's ten stories up in in an apartment building, and there's a park down below, and he shines this flashlight. That park was illuminated. It's awesome. 
um, they advertised, I'm going to get this. I, I'm, I'm just talking about it in my class. It's a tabletop for a folding tabletop for a car. You attach it to the headrest in front of you. It folds down. It's got two other things fold down for cup holders. You've got your shelf right here. Has another thing fold down to put your little cup of whatever snacks. And then it's got a slot for a cell phone, you know, and then it all folds up nice and flat. I, that's just a great idea for trips. Anyway. Um, it's not very expensive. My point is here, Jesus is giving things away, isn't he? Some important things. He's giving them things that these people need. Look, he's teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. That is, that's got to be done. That, there, as a matter of fact, you cannot find, and you guys have heard me say this before, you cannot find in Scripture a miracle that's being done without there also being teaching accompanying it. And the reason for this is the teaching was given and the miracles confirmed that the teaching was true. Okay? So he teaches them. And then what's he, what he's given, he's healing all these diseases, every kind of sickness from among the people. You got a flu? Gone. You got a, a broke leg? Gone. Uh, epilepsy? That's right. Griffin got the snap going. Um, he's Okay. Let's be real. Are you going to go to somebody's house, you're going to be sharing the gospel with them, and you open the door, and, 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 and grandpa's in there, you know, and you can see because of the relaxation on one side of his face that he has recently had a stroke. I, I told you about one of the, one of the customers that on, on, on my mail route that I delivered to, and I was talking to her, and and they've got this brand new mower, and it's electric. He doesn't have to pull it to start it. And she's she's teaching him how to use this, and she's she's been doing this for over a week. And she says she's going up and down, making the cuts in the lawn, and and he says, "Is that an electric mower?" And so you go in there and you think, I'm going to heal you. We'd love to do that, wouldn't we? We're not going to be able to do that. We pray for folks. God heals. That's why we pray that God will heal somebody. And, and, and God sometimes heals somebody quick. Sometimes it's a bit of a slower process. It's all in God's time. So what do we have that we can give away free? What do people need? I, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. Um. <clears throat> I, I'm going to brag for just a minute. I want to boast, if you don't mind. I'm working on my fourth month uh, being under 180 pounds. Woohoo! So my new food regimen seems to be doing what it's supposed to be doing. I will also say I have cut my cholesterol in half. And my blood work was done after I had run out of my cholesterol medicine. And so it went from about 320 to 160. And so, yeah, that's some, that's some pretty good stuff. Um, but, but all of that came through information, okay? Now, one of the things in my food regimen is that I'm supposed to eat fruit. There are certain fruits I'm not supposed to eat. Point is, I like fruit. I don't have an issue with that, you know. Um, so, can't eat too much, right? 
but I'm never really hungry, so it's it's good. You like fruit? Raise your hand if you don't like fruit. Now, I was going to tell you, if you raised your hand, I was going to say, find a different fruit that you like. Because there's all kind of fruit, right? Um, look at Galatians chapter 5. I want, I want to begin with verse 19. Because in verse 19... This is what we're going, we are going to battle with this personally because we have our own temptations that we're constantly working on. But the difference between our dealing with these and other people dealing with these is that other people don't have the same tools in their toolbox in which to fix these problems as we have in ours. So it says here, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality. There's a lot of that going on, right? Idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness carousing and things like these, of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things won't inherit the kingdom of God. And like Aaron here mentioned just a moment ago, what people need is encouragement. So how do we encourage them when they're all dealing with some of these in some fashion in their life? And it is problematic. You know, if you've had, if you've had any of these things, that you've had, that you've fought with, you know, you ever get sometimes tired of the battle? I mean, seriously, I have known Christians that quit being Christians because they were tired of the battle. They just gave up the fight. Don't give up. Satan wants you to give up. Don't. Be faithful, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, until death, and then I'll give you a crown of life. Right? Be faithful until death. We encourage people by giving them fruit. Verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit, and, and again, this is, this is the free stuff that people need, that people want. Love, joy, and peace. You know, these, these, these three things that are mentioned here, that it's all about the heart. It's all about the heart. We want to be loved. We want, we want to experience joy and we want to be at peace. We do, don't we? We want to be at peace with our neighbors. Uh, didn't our bulletin have something in there, uh, from the Proverbs, uh, something about peace? Some, some people like to do something, but uh, uh, there's something about peace in our bulletin there. Anyway, uh, I'll let you guys find that. If anybody wants a copy of our bulletin, let us uh, know and we'll mail it to you. Um, but love, joy, and peace. Those things are all about the heart. And if we fix the heart, isn't that going to encourage people? We show them how to, and, and, and I want to tell you something. There's a lot that people talk about when it comes to love. Everybody has their idea of love. Christians will tell you, you know, other Christians that you meet in other faith practices, they'll tell you what love is. And, and I will tell you, I have read some stuff recently. I'm sorry, that ain't love. It is not love. What love is, is allowing anybody to come through those doors and worship with you and love them enough through who they are when they come in so that when they leave, they are not the same person. Nobody that comes through that door for the first time is supposed to leave the same way. That's not what Christianity is. 
The word, the very word Christian means that you are not, if you're going to accept that term, if you want to be called Christian, that means you are not going to be the same person you were before meeting Jesus. I don't hear, there is, there is a, I think, I think the next series that we're going to go through uh, is going to be the epistles of John. One of the things that John says in there, uh, he defines love. He says, this is the love of God, that you observe his commandments and keep them. What that basically says is, you know, you're not coming to church on a Sunday morning, sit down, sing a song, say a prayer, and then go back to, you know, to, to hit the world's lifestyle for the other 6.8 days of the week. It doesn't work like that. When he says observe and keep the commandments to show that you love God, you know, um, you have to do that all the time. We're supposed to anyway. I know there's times when we don't, but thank God we have Christ and, and he's encouraging to us and forgives us. These next three, <clears throat> patience, kindness, and goodness. This is the disposition that we should be sharing with people. They want to see that we are patient, kind, and good. Where is it, where is it most difficult to be patient and good? Heavy traffic. And people that don't use turn signals. Oh, oh. <laughs> with the kids, <laughs> with the kids. We have, we have a new granddaughter. Oh, it's on film now. Yeah, we have a new granddaughter. She was, she was, she was born two days ago, right around two o'clock. Eight pounds, six ounces, 21 inches long, Brindley Lynn. Uh, and I posted on Facebook, she's got the most kissable cheeks, and boy, she does. Grandpa was just all into that. So anyway, um, so mom says to her older sister, stop doing the bouncy ball in the house. You're going to end up hitting the baby. It wasn't two minutes later when the baby got dinged, you know. It was okay. There was there weren't any even any tears, you know. So it was a anyway. The, the the point the point is is that yeah, children will test your patience. There is a there is a song that uh, a sister in Christ <laughs> she doesn't like singing because. I know that when I sing that, the good Lord's going to put me in a position to test that right away, you know, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, you know, but patience, kindness, and goodness. We, we really, we really need one to help us to employ the others. I think that's why patience is listed first. You know, you're going to need to be a real patient person. For you to be the most kind and good person that you need to be in all situations, right? People can, people can relate to that. You know, when they're having a bad day and we're still good to them, that makes an impression. Then the last three are conduct. Uh, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
this is where that love of God from John's epistle, you know, really becomes uh, evident, you know, in our lives for those around us. And these are the things that we can give to people. Freely give them. All the time give them. Just let it pour from us. Because, you know, Jesus said in John chapter 13, I think verses 33 and 34, a new commandment I give you that you love one another, even as I have loved you and the world will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And, and if, if we, the best way for us to show that we love God, that we love Christ is to, buy, is to translate that love, is to deflect not deflect, to reflect that love that he is giving to us because we need his patience. We need his kindness. We need his goodness. We need his faithfulness. We need his love. Amen? So if we are receiving that from him freely, we can certainly freely give this to others. When we are doing this, we're going to find people that want to know more. We are going to find them. We will be able to disciple these very people. So when he says, go, make disciples, let's make sure that as we are going, we are following the method of Jesus. Amen? I don't know what needs that you may have today, if there's something specific that you're struggling with that... Uh, uh, you know, that Satan may be hammering your life, that he may be wreaking havoc on your soul, and you need some encouragement. Don't hesitate to let us know because we want to encourage you. Amen? If you know somebody that is curious about the gospel and, and you're, uh, uh, you're struggling on how to approach them and you'd like some help, let me know. I would love to go with you. You know, the funny thing is, uh, preachers kind of have this force field around them. You know, when we get too close to somebody, they find out we're a, we're a, uh, you know, we're near a, a preacher. It's kind of like boing, you know, and they kind of back away a little bit, you know. So if, if you find somebody and you need some help, I, I would love to help you. Uh, most of the studies that I've ever come across have been through associations that you guys create, you know, so, uh, so that's there. But if there's any, anything that you need, won't you come forward while we stand and sing? 945. Kneel at the cross. Christ will meet you there. He intercedes for you. Lift up your voice. Leave with him your care and begin life anew. Kneel at the cross.